so let's go into the slideshow. You can see it okay? Yes. Om Magyana Timaranda Syagyanan Jana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tismai Shri Gurave Namaha Vancha Kalpa Tarubyas Jya Kripa Sindhu Paeva Cha Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Okay, so we let's see. <coughs> Lesson five. Qualities and behavior of a Mahatma. Okay, so here are the three objectives for today's lesson. We want to look at examples of Moga Karma and Moga Jnana according to 9.12 of Bhagavad Gita. Then secondly, present how Krishna Bhakti can be easily performed with reference to Bhagavad Gita 9.26. 926 means patram pushvam palam dvayam. And then number three, discuss qualities and behavior of a Mahatma. 9, 13 and 14, giving examples from Prabhupada's Leela. So this is our objectives. Yesterday we were speaking about this Yoga Aishwaram, right? Krishna's mystic opulences. So why doesn't everyone expect or respect Krishna, the Supreme Person? Considering his Yoga Aishwaram, why doesn't everyone respect Krishna, the Supreme Person? Right, we heard about Krishna's Yoga Aishwaram, how he's controlling everything, how he's overseeing everything, but at the same time he's aloof from everything. So why doesn't everyone res respect Krishna, knowing he has this opulence? So this is described, of course, in the next verse. We're going to begin text number 11. Hmm? We know Krishna is the most glorious personality. So why people cannot respect him? And we will see how Krishna gives us different examples. First of all, Krishna will speak about the impersonalists in texts 11 and 12. And then he will contrast that with the pure devotees, the Mahatmas. Of course, the, the, Mahat, the Mahatmas, they have the greatest respect for Krishna. And then 
Krishna goes on, will go on to speak about worshippers of the universal form. There's four verses describing those people. And then we'll finish with the demigod worshippers, which will take us up to text 25 this evening. So these different people, we're going to look at these different categories of people. Impersonalists, Mahatmas, worshippers of the universal form, and then the demigod worshippers. Here's text number 11. A famous verse, often quoted, definitely you'd want to memorize this. You can all chant. Abhajananti mammudha manushim tanamashritam param bhavam ajananto mama buddha manishwara. Right? Fools deride me when I descend in the human form. They do not know my transcendental nature as the Supreme Lord of all that be. So Krishna appears in the human form, and this is bewildering for people. And we see even great demigods like Lord Brahma is bewildered. When he sees Lord Krishna playing the part of a cowherd boy in the forests of Vrindavan, and he's holding the rice in his left hand, and he's, they're playing games with all the cowherd boys. And Lord Brahma's thinking, this is the Supreme Lord? He's my worshipful Lord? It didn't impress. It was, be, it was troublesome for Brahma to accept. So Brahma had to see more opulence. Krishna was portraying the, sweet, the sweetness of his personality. But Brahma wanted to see the opulence. So that was when, of course, Lord Brahma stole away the cows and the cowherd boys. And that resulted in the Brahma Vimoha and Leela, the bewilderment of Lord Brahma. And then Brahma regretted his impudence. So fools deride Krishna when he comes in the human form. And if even Lord Brahma can be foolish, then what to speak of our own selves? We are also much, much lower than Lord Brahma. So we have to appreciate the transcendental form of Krishna. Now, maybe we could say if Krishna had four arms, it would be easier to accept him. Just as he appeared to Vasudeva and Devaki, Vasudeva and Devaki received Krishna, Krishna appeared as their child, but he came in his forearm form, fully dressed and decorated with ornaments and everything, just to convince them that he was God. So Krishna could do that also. But not everyone wants to be convinced like that. Krishna is not so concerned, he's not so eager to convince everyone like that. Vasudeva and Devaki were devotees. So he had a special dealing with them. But not everyone is like Vasudeva and Devaki. And then you, you get people who think that he has, Krishna has acquired the human form. They think that originally he was a, the, it, originally there was only the oneness of Brahman, but he acquired this, this form. But ultimately, they think ultimately there's only the oneness. In other words, impersonalism. 
they don't understand that Krishna's form is transcendental. They think if you have a form, it must be material. And ultimately, transcendence is without form. So this is the impersonal philosophy. So this verse particularly is directed towards the impersonalists. They think that Lord Krishna has acquired this form. They think the this, this Supreme Absolute Truth is without form, it's impersonal, without any qualities. So when Krishna comes with qualities, they think, oh, this is uh, the form of goodness. Krishna, Rama, all the other avatars, they come in contact with the mode of, they're in contact with the material mode of goodness. They think like that, but they cannot understand the transcendental nature of Krishna's form. So that's text number 11. And then Krishna goes on to describe what happens, what's the result of thinking like that. The pure devotees, pure devotees know that Krishna can appear like a, a human being. Ultimately, his supreme form is like this. We are, are made in the image of God. Some people think, oh, we are making God into the image of man. But rather, it's man which is made in the image of God. We take our form because Krishna has a form. It's not that Krishna is taking a form because we have a form. But we take a form because Krishna has a form. So what happens to those who disrespect, who disrespect Krishna's form? This is described in the next verse. Oh well, here's, here's Vishwanath Chakravarti's purport. Would you like to hear this? Someone can read Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's purport on this text, no? text 11. That, that, that well-known uh, Mahapurusha lying on the Karana Ocean with uh, such an anand form, spreading himself through millions of universes, who creates the universe by his own energy, is indeed you. But some say in uh, depreciation, deprecation, that when you come as the son of Vasudev with human-like form, it is just an ansha of that Mahapurusha. In response to Lord, in response, the Lord speaks this words. Yes, they deride this human-like form that I assume they do not know that this human-like body is the supreme form, Param Bhavam. It is my Swarup, my actual form more attractive than any more attractive than and superior to the Mahapurusha lying on the current ocean and other forms as well. What type of form is this? It is the highest truth, Bhuta, meaning Brahman, and it is the great Lord Maheshwaram. The phrase great Lord excludes other meanings of the word Bhuta. According to the Amar Kosha, Bhuta has various meanings such as truth, the elements like earth or being fit. Thank you, Prabhu. So, Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur de de describing for us very clearly that this this uh, human-like form of Krishna, this is the supreme form. But he mentions that some people think that, oh, 
this is just an amsha, this is just a part of the, of the Mahapurush. But he says, no, he said, this is the supreme form, this is my swarup, my actual form, more attractive and superior to the Mahapurush laying on the Kar Karana ocean. So Mahapurush means Maha, Mahavishnu is laying on the Karana ocean and the universities are coming out from him. So we may think that form is supreme, but actually it's Krishna's two-armed human-like form which is the supreme form. We want to understand this very carefully, be convinced of this. Okay. And then text 12 describes the results of people who think like that, who minimize the form of Krishna and think him just to be an ordinary human. Mogasya moga karmano moga jnana vachetasa rakshasim masurim chaiva prakritim mohinim shrita. Those who are thus bewildered are attracted by demoniac and atheistic views. In that deluded condition, their hopes for liberation, their future, their fruit of activities, and their culture of knowledge are all defeated. So, you can see the result, cultivating this mood that Lord Krishna is an ordinary person. The, the, this is demoniac and atheistic. We're thinking Krishna to be an ordinary person, we think his body to be material, we think ultimately there's no form, no spiritual form. So the result of that is whatever they want to do, they will be defeated. Their hope for liberation, their fruit of activity and their culture of knowledge, right? Moga karmana, moga jnana, mogasham moga karmano. So moga karma, the fruit of workers, they will be defeated. The moga jnana, these uh, people who are trying for liberation, they will also be defeated. Who are, who are these moga karmanas? Who are these people who are trying for fruit of activities, who want to enjoy fruit of results? Can you think of some examples in the in the world? Famous. So all the, for me, it's all those people who are working uh, in factories and. Uh, uh, different kind of institutions. Well, those are ordinary people, they're just mudhas. But we want to, we, we're looking at people who are actually endeavoring to try, they actually have a hope, big hope for some wonderful fruit of activity. I can think of one Guru Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Like influencers, Guru Maharaj, there's one new influencer, Indian influencer. Her name was Deepa Koshta. She's very, very famous. She's staying in the Netherlands from India. The father and mother are doctors, but then they move with their children to Netherlands. So she bridges two cultures, Indian culture, Western culture, and very, very uh, influential to the young especially young Indians all over the world with her dressing, her lifestyle and all that. And she's becoming more and more famous. Okay. So she's a fruit of worker. She's trying to enjoy the material world. Is she, go is she going to be successful? What's the goal of her life? To get other young women to be like her, to be famous, beautiful, uh, bridge two worlds, Western world, Indian world, uh, wear two kinds of clothes, 
and then um, uh, influence them to be successful world of fashion and modeling all right so she's still endeavoring for her success but to some extent she's achieved some kind of success some kind of fame we have to see where it's going to lead her Hare Krishna Maharaj, can I try uh, one example? Yeah. As, as Shri Prabhupada mentions, uh, he gives an example of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. So, who was uh, putting his, uh, you know, hard efforts to get the nation free from, you know, the clutches of Britishers. So, he was putting in all, all his efforts. So all this was done only for uh, some material gains. So, even he was baffled. So, yes, that's right. Prabhupada, yes, Prabhupada gives that example. Yes. So, so Maharaj, all people who think that uh, they are in a position to do something, to maybe to do revolutionary things for the world, either for material purpose, and also those people who think that uh, maybe we can categorize them as Mayavadis who uh, say that uh, you know go for self-realization, but they are propagating false theories on self-realization. You know, other than the supreme personality got it, uh, whether they ask you to meditate on the name of karma and on the name of self-realization. Yes. So we want some examples, some famous karmis who were endeavouring to enjoy the material world, but ultimately they failed. So the cele celebrities, uh, superstars, Bollywood stars, they are enjoying the material world? Mm, well, yeah, but they're still endeavouring, right? There's <laughs> They're trying. They're still trying. They haven't. They haven't been baffled fully yet. They're still endeavoring for their. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah. Uh, Prabhu Michael Jackson. Can we give the example of Michael Jackson? Okay. Do you want to tell us what happened to him? Prabhu, he also tried to change his life by changing by doing some plastic surgery and still after achieving so much success, but at a young age he died due, due to heart attack because he was trying to become uh, live forever. But he was not able to do, do that. At last he suffered heart attack and he was, being, he, he was dead. Okay. Yes. He tried everything but he, he cannot solve the problem of life then. Uh-huh. Right. Famous uh, pop star, right? Pop music. He was singing pop music. And so he died. I think he was about 50 years old when he died. Hare Krishna Maharaj, can we take the name of Steve Jobs? He also uh, very much influenced by in, uh, this Indian uh, philosophy, particularly Buddhism. And then he went back to the materialism and very successful founder of Apple. And then finally he died out of pancreatic can cancer. Yeah. Yeah, he died. You know, he... He describes when he was a student, he used to go to Hare Krishna. He used to go to Hare Krishna when he was a student. He didn't actually graduate, he never studied at university, but he, he used to go to the Hare Krishna temple and he used to get prasadam. So, uh, I don't know uh, how much of a failure he was, but certainly died, he met with death, everyone's going to meet with death. Uh, Krishna Maharaj. Yes? And I have one example, a current example of uh, Jack Ma. Uh, he, he is a great businessman, but he still, he, he himself agreed that I have created this business, uh, but still I am not happy by creating the business. Because he was too much busy in his life, he cannot give time to his family. And he's, he cannot, he's not give, able to give uh, time to his life itself. So he was, uh, he, now he's not interested in doing the business as he was doing before. So uh, currently he's not uh, in the direction of spiritual journey still, but he's baffled by the material things. Like doing so much thing, but he's not happy yet. Mm. That's uh, what, the man from uh, China? China, yeah, Jack Ma. Alibaba, right? Alibaba, yeah. Okay. He became frustrated ultimately. Although his business made so much money and he became very famous and everything, but not satisfied. Not satisfied. 
Yeah. And you see also Bill Gates, Bill Gates and his wife, you know, Bill Gates, of course, he made so much money for Microsoft. And then they had also a foundation, he and his wife, they had a foundation to do charity. But then they divorce. They couldn't, they can't live together, even after so many years of marriage. Their marriage ended in divorce. So even their marriage wasn't successful. Maharaj, uh, Ramdev Baba and all the, all, like, you know, the people who are uh, yogis, but they are not uh, spiritual yogis, in what category they would come? Ramadev. Well, Swami Ramdev, yes, he's got the one with the, what's it called? All this soap and toothpaste and everything. Patanjali. Patanjali. Ah, Patanjali, right, Patanjali, right. So he's got a very big empire, big business, eh? made a lot of money, and big name for himself. But what about his goal for liberation? Is he going to be successful, get liberation from the material world? No. What's, we don't know. What's, you know, becomes so entangled in so much business and he has to think about so much money and the different people, with the doctors are challenging him because he speaks openly that I can cure any disease and these medicines they're giving you are useless and the doctors say you have to take back your statement or we're going to take you to court. And so he has to deal with these different issues a lot of different conflicts he's confronted with. So he's supposed to be getting liberated, he's supposed to be working for liberation to get out of the material world, but he's become very entangled in the material world in so many ways. As a yogi, his real business is to show people how to get out but he's spending his time teaching people how to cure their diseases, how to take care of the body. Ultimately the body is going to die. One day all, the body, all of our bodies are going to die. The real success would be if you can close the hospital. But he, they open hospitals and treat the sick. And people get sick and then they come back for more treatment and then more treatment and then finally they die. And everyone's going to die. They can't save anyone from death. So they're spending all their time caring for the body. He's a yogi, his real business would to be to teach people how to get free of the body. But he's spending all his time caring for the body. So I, he's, he's a, a moga karmana. His, his hopes of fruit of activities are defeated. And the moga jnanas, the impersonalists, they're trying to get oneness, to achieve oneness. So. It's a little more difficult to, to say who are these people. We could say maybe people like Prakashananda Sarasati, before he met Lord Chaitanya, he was a monist and he was endeavouring for liberation. But of course by Lord Chaitanya's mercy he was changed into a devotee. So, so many big impersonalist swamis and gurus are there and they will all be defeated. They may achieve oneness, become one with the Brahman, they may achieve oneness for some time and then again come back into the material world. So they're, they're going to ultimately all be defeated. All their culture of knowledge will be defeated. That uh, Prabhupada saw 
It was Dr. Radha Krishna. Now in Prabhupada's time, this Dr. Radha Krishna was very famous. He was the he had been the president of India, and he had written his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. But his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita was impersonal, and it was he who said. It is not to Krishna that we should surrender, but to the unborn, to the, uh, what was it, the unborn, the unmanifest within Krishna, something like this. And so it was impersonalism. So Prabhupada went to see him, but Dr. Radhakrishna at this point was near to death. And he was in a very incapacitated condition. And he couldn't, Prabhupada couldn't talk to him at all, it was just hopeless. And Prabhupada was shocked to see the condition he was in. That although he'd spent so much time working for the country and working for the salvation of the people, but at the end of life he was in a helpless condition. So his culture was defeated. This is the law. This is stated here in this verse of Bhagavad Gita. So these, these impersonalists, we see also it was uh, Vivekananda. Vivekananda also died a very painful death. He had some kind of cancer or something and he was in a lot of pain at the time of death. And he was asking for something, he was asking for medicine, something to relieve the pain. But there was nothing. They had no money. The, the, the mission which he was connected with had no funds, no money. They couldn't give any medicine. They couldn't help him. He was suffering. He died a very painful death. Yes. Was it Ramakrishna, not Vivekananda? No. Anyway, one of them, they, they died a very painful death. Although they were supposed to, they were speaking about the oneness and the liberation and everything, but they were forced to suffer. So their culture of knowledge was defeated. Okay. Okay, here we can read this one. Someone read? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. What is the destination of those who do not accept you? Krishna as the Lord and think that you have a human material body. Even if devotees are in this condition, their expressions are in vain. Mohasa. They do not achieve salukya or whatever else they have desired. If they are karmis, they do not attain the desired results of their actions such such as Swarga, Moog, Karmana. If they are Jnanis, they do not attain the result of knowledge, liberation, Moog, Jnana. Then what do they attain? They assume the nature, Prakritim, of Rakshasa. Hare Krishna. Prakritim. They attain the nature of Rakshasas. Right. They, ass they assume the nature of Rakshasas. That is the result of their efforts. And you can you can see there were great men, big ne big men in the material world. There was this one. There was that one man from England, the famous musician John Lennon. John Lennon, and Prabhupada's time. Prabhupada had stayed at his home for some time, so that John Lennon, he was such a shameless man that he and his wife would go naked on the stage in front of everybody. They were, they, were, they, had, they were so shameless. And yet still people would come to them and ask them, what is your opinion about this? What do you think about that? And so he was, finally he was able to go to America and he moved, he went to live in America and then he was murdered. He was murdered and he was only 40. You said Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson was 50. John Lennon died when he was 40, shot outside his apartment building 
in Manhattan, New York. And so th this is the results of these people, their attempts to enjoy the material world. He had so much money, so much fame, but he had to die in the gutter in the streets of New York, shot dead. And so this is, and then what's his next birth? He would get the, he would have the nature of a rakshasa. Certainly he wouldn't get a good birth. There's so many bad things he'd done, so sinful, so degraded. Okay, here's some more about Mogasha Kalmana. Someone read? Moga Kalmana means fruit, uh, fruitless baffles. Uh, whatever they are, whatever they are doing, doing something, but at the end they will find it is frustration. They are not happy. Take for example, we have practical experience in India, Mahatma Gandhi. He was a great worker for nation, uh, national emancipation, but the end, but the end, he was so much dis, dis, uh, disgusted that I have seen personally. Wherever he used to go, he used to plug in, plug his ears like this. Why? Now, wh wherever he would go, thousands of people would gather and will cry, Mahatma Gandhi ki jai. So the poor fellow could not sleep even the very morning when he was. Mm, I mean to say, assassinated, he said to his secretary, I am so disgusted, I wish to die. You see, this very word was published in the paper. Now see, such a big worker, such a simply a worker, uh, but still, he felt baffled. And what to speak of others? So, Moga Karmanaha, unless we become Krishna conscious, then all our activities will be baffled at the end. Bhagavad Gita 9.11-14, New York, number 27, 1966. So unless we become Krishna conscious, everything is useless. All these big endeavors, so many, some people may be doing great austerities, great tapasya to get liberation, but without Krishna consciousness, it's useless. Harani Kashipu did so many austerities. He wanted to control the universe, useless. And then we have the, we have, who, who, who are some examples of people who did uh, karma kandi activities, trying to enjoy the world from no. Krishna Leela? From Krishna Leela. From 10th Canto Bhagavatam. What are some examples? Kans, Kans, Kans. Huh? Kans. Kamsa? No, I'm not thinking of him. He didn't do anything pious. He was very sinful. Indra? No, what did he do? He was, he wanted to get the, all the uh, worship and all from Go, uh, Gokul Vasis, from Dundavan Vasis. Well, that's, I'm, you know, I'm thinking more, I was thinking more people like Maharaj Niga. Maharaj Niga, he did so much charity, right? And what was the result? Can you take the example of Arna Maharaj? No, I'm talking about Maharaj Niga. What was the result of Maharaj Niga giving charity? He became, became what? Lizard. Right, he became a lizard, yes. He became a lizard. That was the result of all of his charity. He did so much charity. And the, in the end, the result was he became a lizard. So that's one good, very good example, you know. So much endeavor, he did so much charity, gave so many people one little mistake became a lizard in the next life. Hmm? Maharaj, I, uh, I just remembered uh, Mr. Nair, who was very greedy for money, and he uh, was creating too much disturbance for the Bombay project. Yeah, so what?
what are you saying? He's a Mogasya Karma? He's Moga Karmana? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it seems that he was, he created his own local newspaper and uh, uh, all his friends were also telling him he had a big business also and uh, he had a lot of estate and uh, but his dealings were all money minded he was always uh, uh, greedy for money and uh, he used to always cheat he tried to cheat the devotees tried to cheat Prabhupada yeah yes, yes. and what was the result um, he it came to the peak that he was uh, troubling the devotees and Prabhupada so much that one night uh, it apparently looked like he suffered from heart attack, but actually Krishna, uh, I think, defeated him because of troubling devotees so much. Mm, maybe. So he lost, he lost, and Prabhupada got the land, and we could build the temple there. Yes. So the devotees were successful by the grace of Krishna, but the karmis. You're never successful. Endeavor for your sense gratification, you'll never be successful. You always fail. So many difficulties. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Manaji. Very nice. Any anybody has any other examples of Moga Jnana or Moga Karma? I actually Ravana. He was a uh, Pandit, so he was a jnani and he did all the austerities to please uh, Lord Brahma. So can it can he be the suitable example? Hiranyakashipu as well. Well, they're they're great demons, yes, they're great demons, and they're certainly endeavouring for their sense gratification, and they're they're making great endeavours. Uh, what, what is it? You know, the, to, they want to conquer everything, everyone. Radhan, of course, desired to enjoy all the beautiful women, and that's why he kidnapped Mother Sita. And that was the cause of his downfall. Okay, so Moga, Moga Karmana, there's certainly more field, more scope there. Moga Jnana. It's more difficult to think of some examples because we don't actually know. Maharaj, can we have examples of uh, Daksha Prajapati? Daksha Prajapati, yes, well, it, what was the example? What happened? Uh, he tried to travel with uh, the devotees of Lord Shiva and then finally uh, he offended Lord Shiva and he was killed by Lord Shiva. And Later, uh, the head of a goat was fixed on him. So he couldn't achieve a good destination. But because of the mercy of Lord Shiva, he, he got uh, the life was regained and the goat uh, faced down, was fixed to him. Okay. Okay, thank you, Daksha. Daksha ended oh. up with the head of a goat. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, so can we. Consider this in modern is uh, uh, this Swami Rajneesh who himself used to call himself Bhagwan and he was very successful in the western world. Uh, he, even in India he set up a large commune uh, and, and mostly following this uh, Buddhist traditions uh, and still a lot of devotees are there all over the world but uh, somehow there are more Gyanis uh, showing them the path to uh, go to Brahman, so they are more on Brahman realization. Yes, yes uh, you could say, I mean, uh, Rajneesh, uh, they even changed his name to try to preserve some good image of him. He has a different name now. Also. Also, yes, that's right, Prabhu, thank you. Yes, also. Yes, yeah, so all his books, yes, yeah, his, his books are sold everywhere. 
garbage books with all the speculations and all this hodgepodge philosophy. But from here, still active. They still are sent in Pune. Yes. Oh yeah. They're still active. Goes on. All right. So we, when you think about it, you can come up with many examples of people who were all defeated in their attempts for fruit of activities or for liberation. Going to the moon, you know, these astronauts going to the moon, they spent so many billions of dollars to, they say they sent a spaceship up to the moon. What did they achieve? They did nothing to bring back some rocks and say this is from the moon. And in 50 years, it's 50 years since that happened. Nothing has happened, nothing. You can see, they spent billions of dollars in the name of space travel. It's all useless. Okay, let's go ahead. Okay, we're coming, text number 13. After text 11 and 12, we're describing the impersonalists who think of becoming one with the Supreme. We want to become one with the Supreme. So now text 13 and text 14 will also describe Mahatmas, the great souls. Right? Mahatmanas to Mamparta, Daivim Prakriti Mashita, Bajantyananya Manaso, Gyatva Bhutadim Avyayam. So again you see the word Ananya, Ananya Bhakti, Bhajanti Ananya Manaso. So those, those who are not deluded, the great souls, are under the protection of the divine nature. They are fully engaged in devotional service because they know me as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, original and inexhaustible. So you can see the difference between the impersonalists and the pure devotees. The impersonalists, they think of Krishna, they think, oh, Krishna is just an ordinary person. But the Mahatmas, they know Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, original and inexhaustible. And the result is that they're under the protection of the divine energy. Daivim prakritim ashritaha. They're under the shelter of the Daivi Prakriti, the divine energy. So this is the result. Mahatmanas to Mamparta Daivim Prakritim Ashrita Bajanti Ananya Manaso Gyadva Bhutadim Avyayam. So we can see the breakdown of the verse, the Mahatmas, the great souls, are surrendered to Krishna. But daivim prakritim ashrita, they're under the shelter of the divine energy. Why? Because bhajanti ananya manaso, they don't divert their attention to anything away from Krishna. They're fully, they're fully in Krishna consciousness. So this is very wonderful that these devotees are so Krishna conscious. They know, why are they so conscious of Krishna? Because they know Krishna to be the Supreme Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and He is original and in inexhaustible. So they're not practicing their yoga or their devotion for any material purpose. Their only interest is in satisfying Krishna. They have no material desire. Someone can read? Vishwanath, oh, this is Bhagavad Gita, this is Srila Prabhupada's purport. Bhagavad Gita 9.13 purport. In this verse, the description of the Mahatma is clearly given. The first sign of the Mahatma is that he is already situated in the divine nature. The guidance of the spiritual nature is called the Daivi Prakriti. 
divine nature. So when one is promoted in that way by surrendering to the supreme personality of Godhead, one attains to the stage of the great soul Mahatma. Mahatma does not divert his attention to anything outside Krishna because he knows perfectly well that Krishna is the original supreme person, the cause of all causes. There is no doubt about it. Such a Mahatma, our great soul, develops through association with other Mahatmas, pure devotees. They are simply attracted by the two armed form of Krishna. Prabhupada's purports are so sweet. You know, when you read Prabhupada's purports, it's so nice, it's so much uh, pleasing, to, it's so much easier to understand than when we read the commentaries of other people. So Prabhupada is explaining to us the qualification of the Mahatma, but that they're surrendered to Krishna. And they're they're not interested in anything else. Their their minds are just simply focused on Krishna. So nothing is taking their mind away. They're not thinking about yoga cities or they're not thinking about impersonal liberation. They're just simply thinking about devotional service, about giving service to Krishna. That is their interest in their life. And then Prabhupada describes how to become a Mahatma, associate with other Mahatmas. Prabhupada considered the devotees to be Mahatmas. So just anyone engaged in devotional service who is consistent in their service to Krishna, then he's a Mahatma. It's a great soul. So the, the, the nature of the Mahatma is described here. Simply attracted by the two-arm form of Krishna. Right? There are many forms, there's so many Vishnu forms, but the devotee's main attraction is towards the two-arm form. And we saw that with Lord Rama, when Krishna showed the, the uh, Vishwa rope and then he showed the four-arm form. Then Arjuna said, no, no, just let me see the, the two-arm form. He's happy to see the two-arm form. It's the two-arm form which is ultimately the supreme form. And all of the other forms are contained within the two-arm form. Sometimes people think the four-arm form must be the supreme because he has four arms. But actually it's the two-arm form which is supreme. And the forearm form is contained within the two-arm form. Going ahead to the next verse, which describes again the activities of the Mahatma. Satatam kirtayanto mam yatantas jadradavrata namashyantas jamam bhaktya nitya yukta upasate. Nitya Yukta Upasati. That they always worship me with devotion. Always chanting my glories, endeavoring with determination, Dridhavrat. Dridhavrat, that's important. We have to have that determination. We have to be very determined that we're going to do this. We're going to chant. Nothing's going to stop. The bowing down, namashyantas chamam bhaktya, bowing down before me. These great souls perpetually worship me, nitya yukta upasate. They're worshipping Krishna continuously. So this is Mahatma. Okay. So we can see how those people who accept Krishna as he is, how they behave. They accept Krishna as the Supreme Lord and they worship him with devotion.
What are the situation of such great souls? So, first of all, always chanting my glory, satatam kirtayantum mam. Always chanting my glory, as Prabhupada said, this means they're not impersonalists. They're chanting the glories of Krishna. The impersonalists will not chant the glories of, they're not eager to chant the glories of Krishna. They may chant the glories of the impersonal Brahman. They may speak about the oneness. They don't like to glorify Lord Krishna. That's the difference. Yatantash, fully endeavouring, men mental, bodily and vocal, everything in the service of the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna. So this is the thinking, this is the behaviour of the Mahatma. They're fully convinced in Krishna and they're fully chaste in the service of Krishna. They don't go anywhere else. They don't go away. Lord Chaitanya chastised that devotee Makunda. He told this Makunda, he goes here and there. He will go to the Mayavadis and they'll talk about the glories of Brahman. And Makunda will go, yes, yes, very good. Lord Chaitanya told, I don't want to see Makunda anymore. He said, he's like, he is breaking my back. In my face he's very nice and behind my back he's just giving trouble by going to these other places. So we should be chased. Everything should be dedicated to the service of Krishna. Dridhavrat determines, strictly observe the rules and regulations and vows like ikadasi. We have to be very determined. This, this is the meaning of dridhavrat. Dridhavrat, the vow, a determined vow. We make a vow to follow the rules and regulations, which include things like fasting on ikadasi, at least fasting from grains. It may be troublesome, but we have to do it. We, we should be willing to accept difficulties on behalf of Krishna. Then namashyantas, they will, we will bow down. Bow down can also be troublesome sometimes. Somebody may not have health, good health. So even you cannot bow down physically, we can bow down with our mind and we can bow down in words. Just like people like to say, uh, please accept my humble obeisances. And nowadays we have the modern version, people come and say Dandabhat Pranams. I never ever heard Prabhupada say Dandabhat Pranams. I don't know, but somehow it's become very popular in our movement, but I don't think it's quite parampara. Rather we will simply say, please accept my humble obeisances. It's much nicer and much more personal. Dandabhat pranams, people say, I, I, don't, I don't like it, I think it's very impersonal. And then Nitya Yukta Upasati, perpetually worship Krishna with devotion. In any ashram, it's the same. It doesn't matter, Brahmachari, Grihastha, Varnaprasa, Sanyas. Devotional service, is not dependent on the ashram. So we should be ready to worship Krishna with full devotion. So this is the meaning of this verse, 12 and 13 are both describing about the pure devotee. Rather, uh, yeah, oh, 13 and 14. 13 and 14 are describing. 11 and 12 was the impersonalist. 13 and 14, we're hearing about the pure devotees. Right? And then now we're going to go on to hear about others. 
Let's text number 15. Oh, here's some more about Mahatmas. Prabhupada's uh, purport from Prabhupada's purport. Did we read this? Uh, the Mahatma cannot be manufactured by rubber stamping an ordinary man. His symptoms are described here. A Mahatma is always engaged in chanting the glories of the Supreme Lord Krishna, the personality of Godhead. He has no other business. The Mahatma is always engaged in different activities of devotional service as described in the Srimad Bhagavatam, hearing and chanting about Vishnu, not a demigod or human being. Such a Mahatma has firm determination to achieve at the ultimate end and ultimate end the association of the Supreme Lord in any one of the five transcendental rasas. To achieve that success, he engages all activities, mental, bodily and vocal, everything in the service of the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna, that is called full Krishna consciousness. The Mahatmas, great souls, strictly observe all these rules and regulations and therefore they are sure to achieve the desired results. Yes, thank you Prabhu. So, this Prabhupada's purport describing about the Mahatmas. So we ask you, give some examples from Prabhupada's life, how Prabhupada shows the qualities of and qualities and behavior of a Mahatma. Yes, we can have it, an open discussion from the whole class. You can uh, give Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, Prabhupada, uh, whatever he says, he showed how uh, we have to be, uh, uh, he lived as a practical way. He didn't, uh, the words and the actions, there is no difference from Prabhupada. Both are same. What he says, he lived in that action. Can you give an example? Uh, 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 Pro Prabhupada always uh, used to say, uh, attend the Mangalati and he will not, uh, uh, he will not miss any Mangalati wherever he go. Traveling time also, uh, according to the timing, uh, uh, he will not change that. Uh, yeah, I will, I, I traveled, I, I don't want to attend them. But wherever he go, he will attend the Mangalati, he will give class and he has to write uh, again. Uh, the timing, uh, everything he used properly. Well, you should be careful what you say. You know, I don't know where you got that Prabhupada attended Mongol Arti. I never ever saw Prabhupada come for Mongol Arti. Okay, Maharaj. Okay, Maharaj. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know uh, Prabhupada was up. He would be up and he would be writing. But he wouldn't come for the Mongol Arti usually. He wouldn't take part so much in that program because he'd be busy writing and then finishes writing and then after our Mongol Arti, it would usually be like about six o'clock or Prabhupada go for a walk. He'd go for the walk and he'd come back and he'd come back for the deity greeting. And he would always be at the deity greeting. He'd greet the deities. He wanted to see the deities being worshipped nicely. He wanted to see that deities had uh, nice garlands and dressed properly. He was very concerned to see the standard of the deity worship. He trained us like that. But, you know, Prabhupada, uh, although he didn't come to the Mongol Arti himself, he would be listening to hear, to make sure the Arti is going on. I had the experience myself, I was in the Krishna Balaram temple in Vrindavan and it was the midday arti. It was the midday arti. So uh, I was in the temple and I picked up the cartels and we started to have some kirtan. But after five minutes Prabhupada's secretary came out and he said, Prabhupada wants to know, why is nobody playing the Madanga? <laughs> so I said, well, I don't play Madanga, you know. <laughs> so Prabhupada's secretary had to stay and play the Madanga for us. 
But Prabhupada was in his room and he was listening. And he said, he told the secretary, when we do kirtan, must always be madanga and kartals. So, although Prabhupada was not physically present, he would be listening and he would be concerned that everything was done properly. Yeah? Yes. Thank you, Madhuraj. Okay, thank you, Madhuraj. Hare hey, Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. So, one quality of uh, Shri Prabhupada uh, that he's, he was a master, he was so merciful uh, to the whole world that, uh, you know, he delivered Harinam to the entire world. I mean, starting from uh, the hippies and to the entire world. So, he was so merciful uh, on all of us. So, this shows that he was a master. Well, we, I don't know. Is that a necessary qualification for a Mahatma? That you have to give mercy to the hippies? At least being merciful to other jivas in that sense. Like even if we take example of anyone uh, around us. So one who is a Mahatma should be merciful on others, on other jivas. If he sees, he should be compassionate uh, to other jivas. That is one quality of a devotee, being compassionate. Okay, but uh, we, we were thinking, I was thinking more about the qualities which were mentioned in the verse. Maharaj, Maharaj, Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, 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 you can see Prabhupada in the picture holding his speed bag. He was always chanting. If he was not preaching or writing, then he'd be chanting. So he was always, he was always, it was like we say, Satatam Kirtayantumam, always chanting my glories. So Prabhupada was always chanting the glories of Krishna. Either he was addressing the audiences, speaking, giving classes or preaching to the people, or he'd be chanting himself. Uh, Prabhupada asked many times to read his book, and he said that, uh, I, I myself read my books. So, you, you, I'm writing so, much, so many books, but you are not reading. Well, this is also in relation to chanting the glories. This is, here, Prabhupada would sit in the garden in Los Angeles and he would have someone, he would have sometimes his secretary and he'd come and read and have the secretary read to him. That would take place usually in the late afternoon and Prabhupada would sit in the garden and he would have, a, if there was no discussion going on, then he would have somebody read maybe Krishna book and Prabhupada would hear the devotee read. Hare Krishna Maharaj, so yeah. this is the incident from his early life when he was uh, in New York staying with uh, Dr. Mishra and there he was not allowed to uh, do the preaching and which he was very much particular about that besides this uh, uh, Swablam, Kirtanam and preaching is very, very important. So though he didn't have the resources, uh, so but still he separated out, uh, hired a, a small uh, storefront and where he started uh, practicing uh, this uh, uh, Kirtanam and uh, preaching work. So, uh, in spite of all the adversity, uh, he, his vision was very clear that if you want to be strictly on the uh, bhakti mark, we have to spread our philosophy uh, uh, without looking the com comfort of uh, oneself. And that is probably the reason he left Vrindavan and went all the way to United States, uh, steam shipping company. Okay. So, he showed great determination, right? Endeavouring with great determination, Dridavrat. Maharaj, one, one example more, uh, uh, Maharaj, the, 
does not, he he never diverted from his uh, attention whatever he did he was very much sure and he, he never think anything except krishna while doing anything while getting money also or anything like donations or whichever like uh, some people say what will do with the money so prabhupada says that said that uh, whatever money which i will get i will use it for krishna in the service of krishna Yes, if somebody wanted to give donation to Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada would say, you can put it in my book fund. And Prabhupada, would, he had an account which was for his printing books. He said, he said, my Guru Maharaj told me, if you ever get money, use it to print books. So when people would come to offer donations to Prabhupada, he would put it into the book fund and he would use the money for printing books. We didn't see Prabhupada going around purchasing things. He wouldn't, he wouldn't do that. He wouldn't go out shopping and buy things. You know, he wasn't that kind of person. If he needed, some, if he needed something, usually he would just depend on Krishna. If people brought something, then he would, he would use it. Somebody, maybe somebody brought a watch. And then he would take off his old watch and give the old watch to the person and take the new watch. Sometimes do like that. Yes? Hare Krishna Mahas. Uh, one more incident related to this. Usually Prabhupada at his old age, he gave the legal authority to GPC, not to his family or anybody. And uh, though Prabhupada is uh, having family, uh, his son Vrindavan Chandrade, he got the rights to sell the books on the stores of India, but he never accepted anything as his own for his family. And he behaved like a perfect Acharya and a role model for all the people. Well, he was a sannyasi. Sannyasi yes. means a dead man. Sannyasi doesn't have a family. You have to understand that principle. Sannyasi means a, a walking dead man. You don't have connection with the family. You don't have commitments or responsibility to the family once you're a sannyasi. It was a perfect role model on that aspect. Okay. All right, let's go ahead. All right, here's the text number 15, which said, Others who engage in sacrifice by the cultivation of knowledge, worship the Supreme Lord as one without a second, as diverse in many, and in the universal form. Right? So, three different methods of worship. Others who engage in sacrifice, because we've heard about the Mahatmas, we were just hearing about the Mahatmas, and so now different processes are being described. Others who are engaged in sacrifice by cultivation of knowledge worship the Supreme Lord as one without a second. Right? So that is this ekatvena, monads. They worship the self as one with Lord. And that was described in texts 11 and 12. And Prabhupada said, this is the most predominant, mo the, it's very commonly spread, this philosophy that we can become one with the Lord, this impersonalism. So this is the, the, the worship of the Lord as one without a second. Then diverse in many, this is, this is, the, this is uh, Pritakvena Bahuda, it means they, they concoct some form, which means things like demigod worship. So, this will be described in verses 20 up to 25. And then, they worship the Lord in the universal form. This is Vishvato Mukam, worship the universal form. And we will see this described in text 16, 17, 18 and 19. There are four verses there describing the worship of the universal form. All right, so th this is something of a, this verse is something like a summary of what's happening. 
Right? So three types of worshippers and they worship him indirectly. All of them worship Krishna indirectly. The first one, the monis, the most common and the, described as being the lowest, that they worship themselves as one with Lord. And then the intermediate one is the worship of the demigods. And the best one is the worship of the universal form. Right? So you can, you can see, uh, if you read Prabhupada's purport, Prabhupada mentions different kinds of devotees. He talks about the Mahatmas and then he talks about those people who are who have some Sukriti, they've just come to Krishna Consciousness. They're not pure devotees, they're not Mahatmas, but they've taken up devotional service because they have some Sukriti. Remember? Some come in distress, some come in search of knowledge or in search of wealth or out of curiosity. So those people. And then, in addition to that, we have the three kinds of jnanis who worship the Absolute Truth. Three kinds of jnanis. They have the, the monis, and then we have the demigod worshippers, and then we have the, those who worship the universal form. So first class, second class, and third class. But the Ekat Vena is third class, it's the lowest. It's the most predominant, but it's the lowest. And the worship of the demigods is second class, and the worship of the universal form, that's first class. That's the better one. So even though one is a mayavadi, a monist, but still, because he's performing worship of God, he, he knows he's eternal, he knows he's not the body, but he's thinking himself to be God, that's all. So this is a very common philosophy. And then you've got other people, they have their favorite demigod, somebody's a great devotee of Ganesh, and somebody's a devotee of Shiva, or Durga, like that. So they worship the demigods as being the Supreme Lord. But other than that, then you've got those people who worship the universal form. And they see the Lord's form within the different features of the universe and they're worshipping that. So Krishna's got, the next, uh, the next four verses about the universal form, Krishna will explain how to recognize and worship him in the universal form. So we're going to see that text 16, how to recognize him and worship him. Krishna said, text 16, but it is I who am the ritual, I the sacrifice, the offering to the ancestors, the healing herb, the transcendental chant, I am butter and the fire and the offering. So Krishna is saying, he's all these things. This is the, the universal form. How to recognize Krishna in the universal form? Krishna in text 17 said, I am the father of this universe, the mother the support and the grandsire. I am the object of knowledge, the purifier, the syllable Om. I am also the Rig, Sama and Yajur Vedas. Then text 18, I am the God, the sustainer, the master, the witness, the abode, the refuge and the most dear friend. I am the creation and the annihilation, the basis of everything the resting place and the eternal seed. Text 19. O Arjuna, I give heat and I withhold and send forth the rain. 
I am immortality and I am also death personified. Both spirit and matter are in me. So these four verses are describing the worship of the universal form. Krishna is telling us how to see him within the objects of the material world. In the purport, Prabhupada said, since Krishna is both matter and spirit, the gigantic universal form comprising all material manifestations is also Krishna. And his pastimes in Vrindavan as two-handed Shamsundar playing on a flute are those of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. All right, so we're not going to talk much about that, not very significant. We'll go ahead. Next, Krishna will tell us about the worship of the demigods. That's important. People worship the demigods thinking them to be the supreme. And they, they don't directly worship their source, the source of the demigods, who empowers the demigods. And that is the Supreme Lord. Okay? So we're going to see indirect worship of Krishna, text 15, right? Someone like to read? Any others? Now, uh, those who are directly worshipping the Supreme Lord, personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, they have been described as Mahatma. And there are others, worshippers, there, there are others, worshippers. They cannot conceive of the Supreme Personality of Godhead directly on account of being less advanced. Therefore, they have been described here, Anni, others. So others, they worship the Absolute Truth in three different ways. The first class, others. Among the others, there is first class, second class, third class. Bhagavad Gita 9.152-9.18, New York, 2.12.1966. All right, so first class, second class, third class. First class was worship of the universal form. Second class was the demigod. Third class, worship of the impersonalists, the monists. Right? So text 16 to 25, describing Krishna as the supreme object of worship. We already read 16, 17, 18 and 19, describing the universal form. And then 20 to 25, we'll hear about the demigods. All right, here's a very important verse, text number 22. This is spoken, describing very special devotees. Ananyas chintayanto mam ye jana paryupasate tesham nityabhyuktanam Yoga Kshemam Vaham Yaham. That last line. Yoga Kshemam Vahami Aham. For them, I carry what they lack and I preserve what they have. So, this is Krishna's statement in relation to his very dear devotees. Those who have Ananya Bhakti, those who always worship Krishna with exclusive devotion, who meditate on his transcendental form, then to them, Krishna says, I carry what they lack, I preserve what they have. So this is very nice verse, very important for us. Uh, we skipped a couple of verses. Text 20 describes about the yogis, who have some material desires. They're not pure. They have some material desires, but they're yogis. Text 20 said, those who study the Vedas, drink the soma juice, seeking the heavenly planets, 
worship me indirectly. Purified of sinful reactions, they take birth on the pious heavenly planet of Indra, where they enjoy godly delights. So people with material desires may be like that. They can purify themselves of sinful reactions, but still they want to enjoy. They go to the heavenly planets and they stay there for some time. They worship Krishna. They may worship Krishna through the worship of the demigods. And then, once they are purified, they can go to the heavenly planets. And what happens when they go to the heavenly planets? What's the result? What ultimately happens to such improper worshippers of the demigods? They're improper worshippers. Why? Why are they considered improper worshippers? Maharaj, so once the pity is exhausted, he again falls down. So he is not getting out of the cycle of birth and death, but just going uh, ever the higher planet, enjoying the pity, and again returning back to earth, to uh, so going in cycle. Maharaj. Yes, Maharaji. Uh, in the Purpat, Srila Prabhupada says uh, that... Uh, <laughs> you have a baby there. Yeah, in the Purpat, Srila Prabhupada says we are supposed to pour water on the root and uh, not on the leaves and branches. Uh -huh. uh, so... Similarly, actually the worship is supposed to be towards the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna. Um, so it is improperly placed on the demigods. Right. Yes. Right. How should it be properly prayed? How, if, can we worship the demigods at all? No. Only for bhakti, Krishna bhakti. Well, we can worship the de we can offer respects to the demigods, but we offer respects to them not as the supreme Lord, but as servants, as agents of the Lord. By understanding their constitution position. Perhaps. Yes, you have to understand their position. We can we, we do offer our respects to the demigods. Lord Chaitanya would go to demigod temples, offer respects. He would chant. Hare Krishna, he would not chant their names, he would chant Hare Krishna. But he would go and worship. You can worship the demigods, offer respects to them, but not knowing that they're not the supreme, that's the point. Know them only simply as agents of the supreme. Then it's all right. So that, that, then the worship of the demigods is proper. But if we think the demigods, if we worship them as the supreme and think they're independent and they're absolute, then that's wrong. That's not right. So this is the point. Maharaj, can I share one example? Yes. Uh, Maharaj is uh, Vishwanu Maharaj, the father of uh, Shrimati Radha So uh, he was, uh, like he went to Devi's temple and he started uh, you know, worshipping Devi. So Devi uh, again asked him to go and get initiated. So he was initiated, he chanted Hare Krishna Mahamantra uh, in front of Devi, uh, if I'm not wrong, Katyayini, I, I don't remember the Devi exactly. So then the Devi got pleased that, okay, you are chanting, uh, you know, Harinam in front of me. So that is how it could be that uh, Vishwanu Maharaj uh, has the fundamental clear and he's chanting uh, Krishna's name in front of Devi. So even Devi gets, uh, you know, pleased by Vishwanu Maharaj. Okay. All right. I don't know, I've never heard this story before, but sounds all right, quite reasonable, that he was chanting the holy name and Devi was pleased to hear the chanting of the Lord's holy name. 
because she also worships the Supreme Lord. She is also a devotee of the Supreme Lord. All right? So, Krishna says, he will take care of his devotees. I will carry what they lack and I will preserve what they have. Very important verse. I think we have a statement on it. Yes, someone can read what Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur has to say. On the other hand, the happiness of my Ananya Bhaktas is given by me. It is not obtained by pious acts. They are at all times nityam, well versed in matters concerning me, abhiyuktam, and are always ignorant of all other things. Or the phrase can mean, mean that they constantly desire to be in my association for such maintenance. For such persons. For such persons, I take care of their attainment of wealth and their maintenance. Though, though they do not expect such things, it would be unsuitable, unsuitable for the Lord simply to say that He performs these acts. Thus the word Wahami means carry, meaning carry is used. The use of the word Wahami indicates that the Lord bears the burden of maintaining their bodies in the manner that the householder takes the responsibility for maintaining his own wife and children. Thus, one should not say that, like others, their attainment or preservation of bodily needs is due to karma. Yes. So, in the pastime, you remember the pastime of, was it Arjuna Charya? Right? He thought this Vahami is not right. He thought it should be Karomi. I arrange. But he didn't think Krishna would personally do it. But when it says Vahami, Krishna personally is going to come and do it. So I thought, I don't think the Lord is personally going to do it. He thought it should be Karomi. But, <laughs> but the pastime went on, Krishna personally came and showed Arjuna Acharya that he directly comes, he comes himself. So the Lord personally comes to his devotees because they have that faith in the Lord. There was a pastime, Prabhupada was being interviewed by some reporters and they were asking him something and, and Prabhupada was talking how Lord Krishna personally comes. And another devotee was there and he was like Prabhupada's secretary or something and he said, yeah, yeah, Prabhupada means, what Prabhupada means is actually, you know, that uh, he, he, he has a feeling, you know, that uh, it's not that he's, and he tried to minimize the fact that Krishna is personally coming, he tried to say, but it's like an energy or a, a, a feeling that Krishna is there. But Prabhupada stopped him and said, no, he said, Krishna directly comes. <laughs> you know, Prabhupada wanted to make it very clear. He said, Krishna directly, personally comes. And, and Prabhupada said, I have not written these books. Krishna has written them through me. Things like that. So, there, there are examples of how Krishna takes care of his devotees. We see how Srila Prabhupada went to America with no money, but Krishna took care. He sent him everything. The devotees were telling me one time that, that none, of, none of them knew how to type. And they, they wanted, Prabhupada wanted his lectures all to be typed. But none of them knew how to type. Then suddenly this man walked in, a new devotee, he'd never seen him before. And he just walked in and he knew everything about typing and he stayed and he typed all Prabhupada's lectures and everything. He typed all the lectures and he finished typing all the lectures. Somehow he just disappeared again. He never saw him again. And so Krishna just arranged things like this. 
people coming out of the blue, out of nowhere, just to take care of doing these kind of services. What was needed for Krishna's service? It's mystical. This is how Krishna consciousness movement worked. Sometimes we have no money and sometimes Krishna will just send the money just enough to pay off whatever we need so we can continue. So this is uh, a statement in the scriptures. Uh, it continues somewhat, who was reading? You have to keep reading. Still, since you are at Atmaram, Atmaram, enjoying within and indifferent to all things as the Supreme Lord, where is the question of you bearing the responsibility? Because my Ananya devotee has no karma due to lack of desire. His happiness is given by me. Though I am indifferent to all else, I have great affection for my devotees. This is the cause. One should also not say that in giving the burden of their maintenance to their worshipable Lord, the devotees so lack of prema. In fact, they do not give to me that burden. Burden, Rather, I, by my own will, accept it. It should also be understood that I am not bearing it as a duty in the matter that I... Oh, what happened? Yes, go ahead. In the manner that I create and maintain the universe by my will alone, rather being attached to my devotees, I take the greatest pleasure in taking care of their needs, like carrying the weight of one's lover. Oh. Okay, so very uh, powerful statements here from Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur that Krishna takes pleasure in taking care of his devotees. We're not giving a burden to Krishna. Don't give me that burden, but rather Krishna wants it, he accepts it, he, he likes to do service. It's like a transcendental competition. The devotee wants to give service to Krishna and Krishna wants to serve the devotee. So it's like that transcendental competition. The Lord wants to make arrangements to help the devotee. And the devotees, they want to give service to Krishna. They don't want to take service. They like to give service to Krishna. This is the idea. Okay, a, a chance for you. Take a partner and discuss experiences where Krishna carried what you lacked or preserved what you had. And also, why it isn't a burden for Krishna to maintain his devotees. So just give you a few minutes. How many people are here today? Uh, now 26 Maharaj. How, how many? 26. 26. Uh -huh. Okay. So? One, two, three, four, five, six, four, five, six, five, six. Okay, yeah.
for everything. He is not bothered for anything. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. So have you got some example? Yes, Maharaj. Can we? Uh, can I use uh, the sloka number from Putin Putin? Can I use Maharaj? Well, we're, we're talking okay. about how Krishna is maintaining you. Yes, yes, Maharaj. He is sitting in everyone's heart and coming the remembrance, knowledge and forgiveness. I'd rather you stick with the verse we're using. Ah, don't, yes. don't go to another verse. Stick with the one verse. We just want to hear about how Krishna helped you in the situation, how he cared for you, how he provided what you were lacking. So, uh, is that only fifteen point fifteen? Can I use my words? I prefer you didn't. <laughs> uh, Prabhu, uh, nine point twenty two. Maharaj is saying. Yes. Uh, nine point twenty two. Right. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, Maharaj, we will discuss that. Uh, Hare Krishna? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Maharaj, please. Uh, yes, Prabhuji. So, uh, so knowledge and all, uh, so uh, reading the transcendental knowledge and all, it is very difficult for me to understand that. And uh, reading the, when we are reading scriptures, it is very difficult for me. So he helped me to understand the knowledge uh, through the devotee. Recording in progress. Hare Krishna Prabhu. I think I think we should close the rooms now, Prabhu. Yes, Maharaj. I'll do that now. Hare Krishna, is everyone back? Yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, so do we have some, someone like to uh, tell us what you discussed? Did, did you have some very nice experiences of Krishna providing or Krishna carrying what you lacked? Maharaj, once uh, I had to get my uh, niece's marriage. I did not have much fund at that point of time. And it's because of the Lord's help that everything was arranged and the marriage was successfully carried out. Oh, okay. Did you pray to Krishna to help you? Or Krishna just did it automatically? It's, it's automatically I got. Oh, okay. I got a Lord Krishna's grace automatically. I did not pray for but I was, but I got it. Okay, good. So you had experience of this. And at times uh, we fail in certain activities and then uh, we, we get bewildered. But I do not understand, although I pray to the Lord to help me, but at times I don't get the help. <laughs> and I get bewildered. <laughs> okay, so, so sometimes you get bewildered. All right, anybody else? Pranam Yes, Prabhu? Um, I was taking care of uh, the book trust of this one is talking about some marriage. Sorry, Prabhu, your voice is not clear. Can you? I was taking care of Bhaktivita Swami Maharaj book trust, Bhaktivita's trust. Yes. And in one Vyasa Puja, 
it was in Trivandrum, I, I remember. I guess actually, and I, the festival was over, and I had to bring back all those 40 boxes of books which were left out in the book table. And then to back to Hyderabad, I had to move it. And then pretty much every day, all the devotees left the festival. And I, I not had much help, basically. I was in a really helpless condition. And I did not get proper uh, you know, support to move the books to the railway station. I was almost uh, moving all the books slowly uh, in an auto. It was almost 45 minutes late to the train. I was already late. So, but still the train didn't come until I was... Then I moved, moved all the books to the, you know, the platform where I was supposed to go. Then the train came and it was really amazing. So it's really Krishna's help I could see there. Otherwise, I, 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 there is no way out to move those books back. Okay. <laughs> So, by the grace of Krishna, you were alone, huh? Yeah, with a few, few other devotees, but uh, there is pathetic transportation from the place where we had it to the railway station. It was almost 50 kilometers, but I could move only through auto. Four, by, four boxes, five boxes at uh, a stretch. Okay. Thank you. Right, someone else? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, my, my, my experience is very recent. Like when I came to Mayapur in December, uh, I had the thing, it just came with two clothes. First four months was very tough. But after that, I used to just get 600 rupees maintenance. And <laughs> that was also after fighting. <laughs> so, but that four months was very tough. But after that four months, in April, after April, everything suddenly you know, kept coming like I got home without, you know, I got vessels, everything. I got two bicycles <laughs> and I didn't pay for anything. Everything kept coming. And then suddenly uh, there was a CA I was working with before. We were studying in some level. He called and there's a work for you. Right? You are, you know, in digital marketing and all. So there's an NGO you need to work with that. I didn't ask him, but I got the Seva extra job also. The Lakshmi started coming <laughs> and everything is fine. And I was just doing the Seva here, whatever I got. I, I didn't pray like I want these things, but suddenly everything got organized within eight, nine months. And I have everything now. <laughs> wow. And so, yeah. You're very lucky. Krishna is really <laughs> taking care of you. And now I don't feel like going away from here. <laughs> <laughs> I stay in one of the nice places here. And I don't have to pay anything. <laughs> And then uh, the, you said, the, uh, you asked me all the responsibility, Krishna takes responsibility and he, does he feel like burden? But I, I would say like, uh, our parents, they do so many things for us. These days, education and many people are so expensive. Sometimes they take loan to teach their kids to do, you know, the welfare of their children. But they never feel it burden, rather they take that responsibility or and, and they never feel like it's burden to them. Sometimes they, the kids are like, they are not, they are not well, you know, etiquette, they don't have to well etiquette, they, they force for a few things and parents try to fulfill that also. <laughs> okay, so for parents it's a burden, but for Krishna it's not a burden, right? Yeah, no, even like parents don't feel it like burden, same way Krishna is also our, you know, Father, so he, he never feels it as a burden. Okay. So Krishna is the, the Supreme Father. Yes. So he also doesn't feel any burden. He can maintain everyone because he thinks they're all my children. I have a duty to maintain them. Okay, thank you very much, Prabhu. Very good. Okay, we'll just go ahead. Let's get back here. All right, and here's text number 23, talking about the demigods.
Those who are devotees of other gods and who worship them with faith actually worship only me, O son of Kunti, but they do so in a wrong way. Oh, yajanti avidi purvakam, avidi purvakam. They do it in the, they do their yagna in a wrong way. Yajanti avidi purvakam. So, they worship other gods and they worship them with faith. But actually, these other gods are actually, worship, they're worshipping only me. How is that? They're worshipping other gods with faith. Actually, they worship only Krishna. Can somebody explain this? Hare Krishna Maharaj. So yep. all the demigods are the limbs of uh, 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 Krishna. So uh, even this, we worship the different uh, uh, demigods. Uh, ultimately, we are worshiping the uh, Lord uh, Himself. But uh, of course, uh, uh, due to ignorance that we are not understanding that we are really worshiping the Lord Himself. But once we have, if you start worshipping the uh, demigod with a complete realization that ultimately my worship is directed toward the Lord, then that, then we will get the actual uh, benefit of coming out of this uh, cycle of birth and death. Otherwise, we will be getting the whatever the benefits that is the uh, demigod is capable of providing. Okay. And Prabhupada in the purport, he gives the example here, just like Mataji said earlier, they water the root. Instead of watering the root, they water the leaves and branches. They should be watering the root. Krishna is the root, but instead they're putting the water on the leaves and branches. So demigod worship is like that. You're simply, they're simply watering the leaves and branches. So this is the Avidhi Purvakam, you have to recognize the position of the demigods. All right, someone read. Prabhupada. One has to follow the laws made by the government, not by the officers or directors. Similarly, everyone is to offer his worship to the Supreme Lord only. That will automatically satisfy the different officers and directors of the Lord. The officers and directors are engaged as representatives of the government and to offer and to offer some right to the officers or directors is illegal. This is stated here as Aviti. In other words, Krishna does not approve the unnecessary worship of the demigods. Okay. <laughs> so, Krishna doesn't pr approve the unnecessary worship of the demigods. Just like in the government, if you offer the bribe, then the government won't appreciate. You know, it's a crime to bribe the officers. The people taking the bribe are guilty and the people giving the bribe are guilty. They both are criminals. It's illegal. And so we shouldn't do anything illegal. The officers and directors they're representatives of the government. Demigods are also representatives. So we offer respect to them, but we don't worship them as the Supreme Lord. Maharaj, can I ask a question? Yes. So the last uh, sentence is, Krishna does not approve the unnecessary worship of the demigods. So what is necessary? Worship. Well, the point is, there's a proper way to worship them. If you're going to, you, just like you go to a demigod temple, you know, we, we certainly shouldn't avoid going to the temples of the demigods. And Lord Chaitanya, when he was traveling in South India, he would go and visit all the different temples and offer respects. So, we can go and offer our respects to the demigods. And we offer our respects to them, that they're agents of the Supreme Lord. And we can ask them to also bless us with bhakti, with devotion for Lord Krishna. 
and please help me in my service to Lord Krishna. You can approach them like that, just as we can approach devotees and we ask devotees, please help me in my service to Krishna, please bless me. So we can also approach the demigods and ask them also to bless us, that we can be engaged properly in Krishna's service. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. So 23. But, but Maharaj, some officers say that if you don't pay me, your work will not be done. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You may be Krishna conscious, I am not Krishna conscious. I want money. <laughs> <laughs> Right, that's a corrupt government. That's not, but the demigods shouldn't be corrupt like that. Someone please read this article. Worship demigods may be accepted if people know that these demigods are authorized agents of the Supreme Lord. There is acceptance of Supreme Lord, but those fools who do not accept the Supreme God and misunderstand that this particular type of demigod is all in all. Oh, they are doing nonsense. They are placing so many competitors of the Supreme Lord. That is Aditi Purvakam. That is illegal. Nobody can be competitor of the Supreme Lord. The Supreme Lord is known as Asama Urdhva. Nobody is greater than the Supreme Lord and nobody is equal. Bhagavad Gita 9.23, 24, December 10, 1966. Yes, very clear. Prabhupada is making very clear. If we think that demigod is the supreme, then this is nonsense. So, then people may say, well, is it all one? If we worship, isn't it, isn't it all the same? Worship any god, you get the same result? No, it's not the same. We get different results, different demigods. Different people you worship, you get different results. It's not all one. So you worship the demigods, you take birth among the demigods. You worship the ancestors, you go there. You worship the ghosts and spirits, you go there. And if we worship Krishna, we can go to him. So very conclusive in the worship of the demigods. We should understand, if you go to the planets of the demigods, you're still in the material world. You haven't got out of the material world. The whole idea is to get out of the material world. We have to do that, to, to, and to do that we have to worship Krishna. Then we can live with Krishna. So this is also another key verse for us, worship Krishna. Don't worship the demigods. Yes? Let's hear what Prabhupada has to say. Oh. Yes? She is a prostitute. That's all Krishna says. Yanti Devan Buddha Devan Bhagavad Gita 9.25. How you nonsense say that everyone goes to God? This is nonsense. You can go to Shiva, you can go to Indra, you can go... There are so many planets and you will go there. And that is reasoning. And how do you say, whatever ticket I purchase, I go to this Delhi. Therefore, they are, they are nonsense. Mudha rascals. They do not know what is God, what is demigod, what is Lord Shiva, what is Lord Vishnu or Brahma. They do not know. If a woman says, oh, everyone is my husband, then she is a prostitute. That's all. Evening Darshan, December 3, 1976. Very strong words. Prabhupada is supplying the logic though. If someone says, everyone is my husband, <laughs> then what's the meaning? Okay, so then 26, offer a leaf, flower, fruit, water with love and devotion. Uh, 
we, we bring special attention to the, this kind of verse. This is another verse which is directly related to Lord Krishna's very dear devotees, to his pure devotees. Just like Lord Krishna was saying in text 22, to those who are devoted to me and worship me with love. Oh no, what was it? Krishna was saying, uh, text 22, remember the verse? How does it go? Lord Krishna was describing about the importance of worship. Yeah? Yeah, Ananyas Chintayantu Mam, Tek Yan Paryupasate, Te Shamnit Yabayuktanam, Yoga Kshima Bahamiyaham, right? So Lord Krishna was describing there um, Paryupasate, properly worship, and Nitya Bayuktanam, always fixed in devotion that indicates that how absorbed you have to be in Krishna consciousness. Right? We have to properly worship and be always fixed in devotion. In other words, we have to be fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness. Then Krishna reciprocates. Prabhupada, Prabhupada in text 22, he talks about living you cannot live for a moment without Krishna consciousness. Think of Krishna naturally 24 hours a day. And because of our absorption in Krishna, then Krishna can't forget that devotee. And Krishna is con concerned to take care of that devotee. Now here in text 26, it's a bit different. A little bit different, but still, again, it's relating to the very pure devotees. The word bhakti is there, it's coming up twice in the verse, right? And what do we have to offer to Krishna? Krishna, we see Krishna is not greedy for the offerings. It's a very simple method of worship. The things are, in the singular case, a leaf, not leaves, but a, a, a single leaf, a single flower, or a fruit, or water. You know, things which are found everywhere practically in India, we can find these things, leaf, flower, fruit, water. So Krishna is not greedy for the offering, but what he wants is the devotion, the bhakti. It's that bhakti which Krishna wants. And the devotee takes pleasure in offering these things. In contrast, you worship the demigods, you need to make big offerings, you have to have a lot of things, a lot of paraphernalia, you have to have a lot of fruits and a lot of ghee and so many things. There's no mention about devotion, but, you know, it's all the offering. The demigods want the offering. Krishna wants the devotion. That's a different mood. So worship of Krishna is very simple, very easy for us. Of course, devotee doesn't just offer these kind of items, but we offer our life to Krishna. We want to give everything to Krishna. And, Krish and Krishna says, uh, Ashnami prayatatmana, I will accept it. Krishna can also mean I will eat it. Krishna will take it, he'll accept it. Right? We see examples like Vidura offering his bananas, and he got so confused, he offered the banana peels to Krishna, but still Krishna accepted them. Someone can read? How do you 
can one learn to love God? There are six kinds of reciprocation, six kinds of exchanges. Dadadi. We have to serve God in that way. Therefore, if you want to serve Him, start with some offering. Patram Pushpam. Anyone who anyone can offer a little flower, some fruit and a little water. So that Lord say, Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam. You may Bhaktiya Prayachadi. The important thing is love. Lecture on Bhagavad Gita 9.24-26, New York 66. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Some other examples from scriptures, how Krishna is controlled by the love of his devotee. Of course, the picture is here, Mother Yashoda controlling Krishna. Some other examples. Um, Maharaj, we see the example of Advaita Acharya. He offers just a simple two seeds and water and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appears on the being of the movie. Okay. Advaita Acharya chanted and called to the Lord to come. He offered Ganges water and Tosi leaves and the appropriate prayer. Then he asked the Lord to come and deliver the world. Okay, very good. Advaita Acharya calling Lord Chaitanya to come. Hare Krishna Maharaj, yes, may I? Yes, Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj, uh, 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 Krishna, when he was very small in, uh, in, um, in Vrindavan, uh, you know, the gopis used to make him to dance for a couple of times and Krishna would like to have little buttermilk and the gopis would uh, request to go on dancing for some more time. Then they would offer little uh, buttermilk to Krishna. So, lovingly controlling Krishna. Okay. I don't know. I never heard this before, but if you tell me, it sounds reasonable. Yes. Maharaj, uh, in Ramayan, Shabari gave the fruits to Krishna. First, she used the first she tasted those uh, fruits, and then like you know, t just to make sure that whether sweet or not, and then she offered it to Ram, Lord Ram, and Lord Ram accepted. Lord Ram took Shabari's remnants. Huh? <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you. Hey Krishna Maharaj, as we see in this picture, uh, the Ramada Lila. So uh, the Lord uh, is, you know, being controlled by Mother Yashoda, being fearful and, you know, just running and, and from him, even the fear, personified fears, uh, he is fearing from, uh, you know, his mother. So that is how he is being controlled by Mother Yashoda. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaji. Uh, Mother uh, Maharaj, uh, when Krishna has visited to Pitra's house, when he went uh, messenger, he visited uh, Vidra's house and he offered fruit, banana, he offered, he accepted with uh, love. Okay, yes. Krishna serving as the charity of the and controlled by someone who changed the direction of the charity. All right, yes. Krishna becomes the chariot driver of Arjuna. Good. And then Krishna uh, is accepting whatever we are giving, uh, like an offering in deity form. Okay. As a deity, Krishna accepts whatever. Well, <laughs> we hope he accepts, you know. <laughs> we hope. You know, I mean, we, we shouldn't just offer anything. We want to offer with love. With love, yeah. Mm. Krishna Maharaj, I have an example, sorry. Yes. Uh, when, when Sudama was at the gates and uh, the guards wouldn't let him because he was very shabbily dressed and he said he wanted to visit Lord Krishna. So Lord Krishna heard, heard about it and he ran barefooted to greet Sudama, brought him in and got his wives to bring the warm water with, uh, with some, some, some flowers and he personally washed uh, Sudama's feet. Oh, really? I didn't know he, he was, uh, had difficulty to get in there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but I know Krishna certainly received him very nicely and washed his feet. Because he's a brahmana and Lord Krishna always shows his respect to the brahmanas. And Lord, Lord Krishna accepted 
so damaged rice. He brought some very dry, very broken rice crumbs. And Lord Krishna took some of that rice. Because although Sudama didn't like to give it to Krishna, but Krishna knows everything. And he knew Sudama had come there with the rice. For, so he personally found the rice and he took some of that rice and tasted it. Mm. So many examples are showing there, showing the love of Krishna for his devotees. Okay, so that's, the, we've covered up to that point tonight. We're still, still have a bit more to do. So next class also will be on the ninth chapter and we'll finish the ninth chapter and then we'll have an overview over the ninth chapter again and we'll see the main points. So if you have any questions, you can uh, have them. Any questions today? Anyone? No? Okay. Krishna Maharaj, I have a question. Yes. My question is, um, my question is actually in relation to uh, the principle of, of uh, chaste, Yatantas, and also the unnecessary worship of demigods 9.23. There is one particular speaker who likes to always speak about, about uh, demigods festivals. Uh, whenever uh, he's invited to give a talk on the Knowing Your Vedas talk, which he normally does, he always speaks about the demigods festivals, but he never mentions Lord Krishna. He doesn't mention the position of the demigods in relation to Lord Krishna. Just speaking the glories of that particular festival of the demigods, uh, taking about sometimes three hours to, to speak. So that went on for 10 years actually, uh, uh, you know, in, in our temple for a long time until uh, 10 years later, uh, I think by Krishna's mercy, uh, such an activity stopped by itself. But this went on for many, 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 many years like that. And the uh, devotees used to sit very uncomfortably in the class because it, has, it, had, it had nothing to do with them. They're no longer following all these festivals like that. Even recently in the Zoom class, he's giving he was giving classes to glorify the demigod festival again. But his style is he won't talk in relation to Krishna, not like what I'm learning in chapter nine, the position of the demigods in relation to Lord Krishna. May I have your thoughts on that, Guru Maharaj? Thank you very much. Well, I don't know the circumstances. Are you saying this took place in an ISKCON temple? Yes. Oh. In ISKCON, because he's a very influential speaker, quite powerful, also knowledgeable, and he knows a lot. So people are afraid of him. You know, they're very scared to say something to him. He might get offended. His stance is like that, powerful. Uh huh. Well, we certainly, you know, we, whoever's in charge of the temple, they have to be careful to monitor these issues, you see. I mean, this is a management problem, really. If somebody's doing like this, you, you know, probably, I mean, because you're all South Indian Hindus and you have some particular feelings for these different festivals, they're an important part in the, in the culture there. And they're often celebrated holidays there, you know, like Taipusham, you know. Taipusham is a big holiday and everybody goes. So, and we do take part in it. We do go there and we do, uh, we do distribute a lot of books there. So, we're not against these festivals if we can uh, utilize them for propagating Krishna consciousness. That is the idea. We have to see everything in relation to Krishna. So somebody's speaking a lot about demi, then you have to try to maybe ask questions, you know, at some point he should offer any questions and then you can ask, you know, how does this relate to Krishna consciousness and what is the position in relation to Krishna? So we have to always Try to bring up Krishna consciousness. If somebody's going offline, off target, we have to bring them back. Some people, of course, they do have that tendency because they had that upbringing 
They were brought up in that culture of the worship of the demigods and all these festivals. And Krishna consciousness is something new for them. So they have difficulty to bring it to Krishna consciousness. So you have to help them. You have to try to bring up Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, don't sit and listen. <laughs> Get out. Just stand up and walk out. You know? Some of these speaking things which are not relevant to Krishna consciousness, you don't need to waste your time. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, so thank you. Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, I have a question. So, uh, in the 14th verse, when it is said like the Dhridavata, that Sadhatam Pityantamam Yadanda Dhridavata, so there it is, uh, I mean, uh, explaining the Dhridavata means, you know, uh, following the rules and regulations or the vows strictly. So, my question is, Maharaj, like how to draw a line between this, like being Dhridavata and then uh, the Niyamagra principle that is there in the nature of instruction? That uh, uh, the being Niyamagra, too much attached to the rules and regulations, is a obstacle in the path of bhakti. Uh -huh. So, how we can understand this, or how to like draw a line between being Jiravata and you know Niyamagra? Yeah, well, you have to consider which particular rules and regulations you're talking about. What are the circumstances? It's going to vary. You know, when we talk about Dhridavrat, we talk about things like principles, like chanting 16 rounds, following ekadasi, observing fastings on particular days. At least the, this is Dhridavrat. We have to, we, we take it very seriously. So, fasting on ekadasi, somebody may think not very important, but it's important. It's a part of devotional service. I was in the temple one time when we, somehow the devotee, uh, it was a courtesy, and somehow beans were cooked, and beans were in the sabji and served out to the devotees. And when they told Srila Prabhupada that the devotees had been served beans and they'd all broken the courtesy, Prabhupada was very upset. And at first he said, you all have to fast for three days. <laughs> but then he said, tomorrow, you all have to observe a courtesy. He said, it's very, this is very serious. You have to take these things very carefully. So, a courtesy, you have to do it. And similarly, chanting. We have to chant every day. It's important. Following four principles, it's important. We can't compromise on these things. These are principles. So some things, Sometimes, you know, like, oh, maybe you couldn't go to the morning program, or maybe you, you were, maybe you had a fever or something, you, or maybe you had, you had COVID, you, you couldn't go to associate with people, you know, you can't go anywhere, you just stay in isolation. Okay. So, times and circumstances, you have to adjust the rules and regulations. Similarly with eating, we're not supposed to eat at night. But if the devotees didn't get any lunch, maybe they only had breakfast and they didn't eat a whole day, then at night they're going to need to eat. Usually we don't eat at night, but if they didn't eat any lunch, then they have to eat in the night. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, when we uh, break the fasting, Egadashi fasting, and next day we are fasting for Egadashi, how to break that fasting, Maharaj? Uh, so, uh, so Egadashi time means uh, on Duvadashi day we will uh, break the fasting on a pranam time. So, next day when we are fasting, how to break that fasting time? Well, we're, we're fasting. Are you doing Nirjav or? A courtesy fasting. Fruit and juice. No, no. Oh, you, you take fruits and juice. Okay, so then you, you still have to eat grain. You have to take some grain to break the fast. Okay. Right. Oh, any timing we have to, to any timing we have to make it. 
Well, the, the, the Akadasi Prana, the time to break the fast is on the calendar, right? There's a special time. It's all calculated. A particular time when we're supposed to break the fast. So it's somewhere in between that time, you know, when the, when the time is, period is there, you have to break the fast at that time. Thank you. Lord Chaitanya instructed this to Sanatana Goswami. He, he warned that the devotee, the devotees, they should do this, that they have to break the fast at the proper time. So they, every year they give the calendar. Now you see the time varies. It's not the same time every day, it varies. So you have to get the Vaishnava calendar and it will tell you what particular time, when you, what time on the Dwarasi, when you're supposed to break the fast. Now sometimes the time period may only be like 10 minutes and sometimes it may be three hours or more. So you have to check the calendar and see the particular time for that particular ecodicy when to break the fast. Thank you, Mother. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. No, Mom, try to go. Okay, we will stop here then, if there are no more questions. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah, one doubt, Maharaj. If Damodrama Mahaprabhu Mantra is coming, so if uh, the period time can be offered, D-Ramp to Damodra? Uh, period time? Yeah, I think you can. Yeah. So I, we can offer uh, Prasadam also? Offer Prasadam? Well, it depends. What are you doing at home or in the temple? Yeah, home, home, okay. Oh, yeah, well, at home you can do these things, yeah. Okay, thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. Okay. Actually, in, in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna talks about uh, the cleanliness. Where is it mentioned now? Uh, where Krishna is talking about... There's a particular verse in the Bhagavad Gita, I can't remember exactly where it is now, but they talk about the cleanliness and they say, talk about when the woman is contaminated, at that time she shouldn't be doing anything. She shouldn't be touching, cooking, or like that. It, but it depends on your situation, if you have somebody at home to do the worship for you or not, or to do the offering for you, you know? If you have somebody there at home, they can do it for you, that's better, because you're not clean. And so when you're not clean, then Krishna won't accept what we offer. Oh, actually it's in relation to this verse, when Krishna is talking about a, a leaf, a flower, fruit, water, with love and devotion. So our love and devotion is in our purity, in our cleanliness. Cleanliness is a part of our love and devotion to Krishna. So if you're in contaminated stage in that time of the month, then it's not proper actually for you to offer. Or, or to cook. You're not supposed to do anything. You're supposed to just sit and chant and like that. But you have to consider the situation at home. Is somebody else there to do it for you? You know, if somebody else is there to do it for you, then that's good. Let them do it. Okay, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Okay. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Day. <clears throat>